He's Dr Chris. He's Dr Zand. And yes, we're identical twins. Do you know your body does heaps of amazing things every single day? That is incredible. And we're going to show you how. Ah, you've cut him in half. We've got incredible experiments. <sighs> And real-life medical emergencies... The doctor's going to make it all better. Ouch! We'll be turning our bodies inside out. Oh, yeah! To show you what you're made of. You should see a doctor. Better go find one. <coughs> Dr Zand! Mm. Coming up today on Operation... Ouch! It's bath time for me and Zahn. Oh, oh! This is hot. Our travelling clinic is ouch and about. Can I see the next patient? And will Zahn's body give him away when he tells a fib? Uh, I like to do ballet dancing. OK. But first... Let's see who's turned up in accident and emergency. This is not for the squeamish. <laughs> At Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool, 13-year-old Scott has come in with an injured leg. I thought it was a scratch. I turned down to look at my leg and it was a big chunk of my leg missing. How on earth did you do that? <sighs> Scott was out riding his mountain bike with his friends. What a mountain? Hello, goatee. Don't be ridiculous, Zahn. They were just in the street. Righto. Um, they're not wearing helmets. I know, Zahn. They were doing wheelies to see who could go the furthest. Whoa, dangerous stuff. Yep, and Scott was mid-wheelie when suddenly his foot slipped off the pedal and his leg scraped on the gear cog. Oh, he's lucky he didn't fall on his head. Is he OK? Well, at first he thought it was just a scratch, but when he saw it, he cried out. Ouch! OK, so how bad is this cut? You can almost see his bone. It's quite shocking, really, <laughs> to look at. Ooh, it does sound bad. Let's see. OK, Zond, if you're squeamish, look away now. Whoa! It's a huge cut! Must be sore. So next, Scott needs an X-ray to check his bones. There's the big hole right there, but luckily nothing's broken. The worry now is possible tendon damage. Tendons are what holds muscle to bone, and a tear to them could affect the movement of Scott's foot. Here to check that out is Dr Ankur Sinha. Can I just ask you to move your toes a bit? They're wiggling. Well, that's good news. And can you move your foot? The movement of his foot suggests that the tendons are intact, uh, but we still cannot be sure because if they are partially teared, we would still need to uh, repair it. That's one of the concerns at the moment. Then we'll make him comfortable and then await uh, for further action to take to theatre. So Scott's having an operation to fix the hole in his leg and make sure there's no other major damage. We'll see how he gets on later in the show. Ouch. And now to our lab for some amazing body experiments. Ouch! Just don't try anything you see here at home. As you can see, Chris is on an exercise bicycle. It's hardly a bicycle. It's more of a unicycle. It doesn't even have handles. It's extremely uncomfortable. Shh! This is science! The reason Chris is on the bike is because I want him to try and heat up this beaker of water to exactly 37 degrees Celsius. I think I got the short straw here. My bike is actually generating electricity to heat up the water in that beaker. Do you need a rest, Chris? Oh, yeah, thanks. We can't have a rest. Come on, keep going. It's 35, 35 and a half, 36, 36.5, 37. Perfect, you can stop. Oh, you've overshot. It's up at 38. Sorry, I'm going to have to add a load of ice and then we'll start all over again. That's good. Keep going. Now, 37 degrees isn't just any old random temperature we've plucked out of the air. It's the temperature of your body's core, which is this bit here, where all your internal organs are. Oi, you don't need to prod me. <laughs> so your organs work best at 37 degrees and your body tries to keep your insides at exactly this temperature. You know what? I've had enough. I think I have clearly demonstrated that trying to keep something at constant temperature is hard work, but your amazing body does it every day without you even noticing it. And no matter what you throw at it, as we're about to show you. Today, we're going into battle with our own bodies 
to see if we can get our core body temperatures to change. It's time for Crescent Zand versus our core body temperatures. Snappy name, Zand. Thank you. Now, we can only do this experiment because we're doctors and it's being done in very controlled conditions. For this battle, Zand is going to sit in a super hot bath for 10 minutes. While Chris will sit in an ice bath for 10 minutes. He'll be freezing and I'll be boiling. But will it affect our core temperature? Let's find out. So I shall be Captain Cryogenic. I shall be... Dr Warm. Dr Warm? Is that the best you can do? I think it's quite a good name for a core body temperature fighting superhero. What's so great about Captain Cryogenic, anyway? Well, for a start, the words Captain and Cryogenic both begin with the same letter. Hmm. OK, so we're ready to go. It's time to try and beat our core body temperatures. Let battle commence. Oh, oh. So Chris gets into his ice bath. Oh, oh. While Zand hops into the toasty warm bath. This is hot. <gasps> We've already taken our core temperatures and we both got a reading of 37.7 degrees Celsius. Now, to do this experiment properly, we've put special super-accurate thermometers inside our bodies. Can you guess where they are? Is it A, in our armpits, B, in our stomachs, or C, up our bottoms? The answer is C. But don't be alarmed, they're coming out as soon as all this is over. Remember, we can only do this because we're doctors. All we can do now is wait for our bodies to feel the effect of the different temperatures. Zand, your face has gone bright red. You can see I'm sweating. Now, that's good, because it means my body's getting hotter, but it also means my body's fighting back. The sweat evaporates, taking heat with it. Now, I'm feeling very cold, but I'm shivering, and that's a reflex that your body uses to jiggle around and generate heat, so I know it's fighting back. Ten minutes are up. Time to find out if we've managed to beat our core body temperatures. From this thermal imaging camera, we can see how warm Zahn's outer body is, and that's because his blood has rushed to his skin to cool him down. And Chris's body on the outside is cold and blue. That's because his blood has rushed to his vital organs to keep them warm. But the important question is, have I managed to beat my body and bring my core temperature below 37.7? And have I managed to bring my core temperature above 37.7? What? 38.4? I've actually got warmer. My body has fought against the cold so effectively that it's made my temperature rise. Well, so much for my attempts to defeat my body's own core temperature. Let's see how Zahn got along. Chris, that was a crashing defeat for you. But I'm hoping I've done a little better. 38.1. So I've beaten my core body temperature by four tenths of a degree. That's really not very much at all. My body's done an amazing job of keeping me cooler than that bathwater with all the going red and sweating. No matter what your surroundings, your body fights hard to keep your core at the ideal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. Now, Chris, I've been thinking about an alternative name for Dr. Warm. What about Wizard Warm? Right, Sam. That's a great idea. I think you should go and get a hat made straight away. That's a great idea. I'll go and do that. Oh, that's a beautiful idea. Now we're getting out and about with our mobile clinic. Today, we're at a theme park to help solve your medical mysteries. If you're anxious about an ailment or curious about a condition, then the Ouchmobile is the place for you. That is incredible. Zand is preparing the clinic ready for his first patient. And Chris is out in the park to answer your burning questions. Now we're ready for business. Can I see the next patient? First up is Anastasia, with something she feels she needs to keep a watch on. Anastasia, what's brought you to the Ouchmobile today? I have something strange hidden under my watch. So, what's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of I've got something strange hidden under my watchitis. That's exactly what I'd say. Let's have a look then. Oh, that's great. So that is what a doctor would call a compound melanocytic nevus. It's a mole. So what you can see here is very typical mole. It's quite a big one, but it's got irregular edges. It's a patch of darker skin than the surrounding skin, and it's slightly raised, but it looks like a very typical mole. How do I know if it's dangerous? 
Sometimes moles can cause trouble. The things that you'd look for, if it changes shape, it changes size, if it changes colour particularly, or it becomes itchy, or it starts to bleed at all, any of those changes, you want to take it to your GP and get them to have a look at it. Thanks for answering my questions, Dr Van. Away from the clinic, Chris is out and about in the park solving your medical mysteries. Dr Chris, why do you get um, pins and needles sometimes when you lie in a weird position? When you're in a weird position with either your leg or your arm, what's happened is you cut off the blood supply to that limb. So often you'll find that the arm or leg goes dead and you can't feel anything at all. And as the blood and oxygen go back to the nerves, they wake up again and start sending all sorts of weird signals back to your brain, which you feel as pins and needles. Why do you have a stitch when you run? You'll notice your stitch is worse if you run soon after you've eaten. And that's because when you run, you want to send all the blood in your body to your muscles so they can do work. And that takes the blood away from your guts. And if you've eaten food, your guts are trying to digest the food. And if they lack blood, then they start to hurt and they start to complain because they want more blood. So if you run on an empty stomach and you warm up slowly, you won't get the stitch. Back at the clinic, there's a familiar face in the waiting room. Can I have the next patient? Oh, it's you again, Anastasia. Yep, she's back for more. So, Anastasia, how come you're back? All my friends in my school have an innie belly button, but I have an outie. What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of I've got a belly button that doesn't know where it's supposed to be itis. Spot on. That is a very impressive outie belly button. So why do I get an outie belly button? When you're inside your mum before you're born, you need to get fed. And you don't get fed through your mouth. You actually get fed through your belly button through a thing called the umbilical cord. And that gets blood and nutrients and oxygen into your body. And after you're born, you don't need it. So we clamp it off, and the cord just dies and falls off. And usually, when things die and drop off, you get a bit of a scar formation. That scar tightens up and pulls the belly button in. But in lots of people, that doesn't happen. But it's not a problem. It's completely normal. In fact, it's quite special. <laughs> Job done for today, clinic closed. Still to come, Chris helps to answer the UK's emergency calls. The most important thing we're worried about is a heart attack. We show you how to cope if this happens. You knocked my tooth out. And I take a lie detector test. I was recruited to be a spy while I was at university. OK. Remember Scott and his badly cut leg? Well, let's find out how he's getting on. And this is not for the squeamish. Whoop! Back in Liverpool, Scott's been in overnight with an injured leg. Scott was on his mountain bike having a wheelie competition with his mates. Um, they're not wearing helmets. I know, Zand. Suddenly, his foot slipped off the pedal. Oh, be careful. At first, he thought it was just a scratch, but when he looked at it, he cried out. Ouch! It is hurting me, but a lot better from yesterday. It might not be as sore as it was, but Scott needs an operation to get that wound fixed up. So it's in with the anaesthetic and off to sleep for Scott. Now it's surgery time. A few tweaks and... Let's give it a wash and see what we're dealing with. In the hot seat today, surgeon Ravi Badge. First, Mr Badge needs to cut away all the dirty, contaminated tissue at the edge of the wound. He then gives the whole thing a right good clean to keep it free from infection and help it heal. Soon, it's time to start stitching. If you're squeamish, look away now. There, that's that. Great job, Doc. Very neat. Scott was fortunate that he didn't do any damage to the nerve and the blood vessel which is running on the back of his leg. He got away with the minor injury. Scott's soon up on his feet again and keen to get back to his favourite hobby, boxing. Bye, Scott. Bye. Ouch. It's not only emergency departments in hospital that deal with the unexpected. That's right, Chris. There are expert teams all over the UK ready for action. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services. If you have an accident, an emergency service like this won't be far away. Paramedics use these state-of-the-art vehicles to get to emergencies in minutes. And today, I'm going along to see what it's like to be the first at the scene. 
This fast medical service is on standby, ready to help 24 hours a day. You never know exactly what we're going to see when we get there, but I've got my camera and Eric in the back has got his. So we're going to get right up close and see what's happening. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. And a new case is just in. So we just got information. This is a 40-year-old woman. She's got chest, upper back pain. The most important thing we're worried about is a heart attack. Jan grabs her gear and gets inside. What's been happening, Tanya? Oh, gosh, I had gall stones removed. It's the same pain. The same pain as what you had before? The same pain. Let's give you some gas in there so we can try and get you a bit more comfy. Tanya's quite distressed, so Jan gives her some painkilling gas to help. It doesn't look like it's her heart, and it may be related to an old problem. So Tanya's previously had gallstones, which are stones in a part of your body called the gallbladder. And the gallbladder secretes stuff into your gut that helps you digest food. And if it gets blocked with stones, it can be intensely painful. The only difference is it's in my back and shoulder as right. well. So this time it feels a bit different to her gallstone pain, and the ECG confirms her heart is fine. There's an ambulance on its way, all right. But Tanya's going to need to get this new pain investigated in hospital. So while, is, while we're waiting for the ambulance to come, I'll try and get you comfy. And because she's in some discomfort, Jan decides to put painkillers directly into her bloodstream. Like that should start having a bit of an effect soon. Finally, she's now able to make her own way out to the ambulance with her pain under control. So Tanya's biggest problem was that she was in a huge amount of pain. Luckily, Jan showed up with some reassurance that it wasn't her heart. She's off to hospital, but they'll be able to get to the bottom of exactly what's going on. And if you ever have an emergency, there are hundreds of similar crews around the country ready to help. If they can't fix you at the scene, they'll get you straight to a hospital for more treatment. Did you know your teeth are as unique as your fingerprints? Even twins' teeth are different. So, look after those gnashers. I don't know about you, but Dr. Zahn goes absolutely stir-crazy if he can't get enough exercise. Fortunately, it's possible to get exercise even if you don't have that much space. But remember, even the back garden can be a place of danger. Well, I'm sure I don't have to point out what could go wrong here. I mean, Tom could fall and break his leg. I don't think so, Chris. Well, you might trip up and twist your ankle. No, it's not going to happen, Chris. Well, you could fall and just hurt your wrist. Chris, I'm really very good at this. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> I told you, Chris, I'm not injured at all. I am. <laughs> you got my tooth out. Uh-oh, looks like an injury alert. So what should you do if you knock out a tooth? A, get an eye patch and enter a fancy dress competition as a pirate. B, ring the Tooth Fairy helpline. Or C, stop the bleeding and put the tooth in a glass of milk. You guessed it, the answer is C. Stop the bleeding and put the tooth in a glass of milk. And here's how. Oh! My tooth! OK, so the first thing we've got to do is stop your mouth bleeding. Mm. Does anyone have a cloth I can use? Dr Dunn, I've got a cloth. Thank you very much. So, put it in the hole and apply pressure to stop the bleeding. Oh, good. Now we've stopped Dr Chris's mouth bleeding, we can pick up the tooth. Right there. And if only I had a glass of milk to put it in. When you put the tooth in milk, it keeps the tooth alive. That means there's a better chance a dentist can put it back in. Now we've got the tooth safe in the milk, we take Dr Chris to the dentist. Now remember, you only need to do this if it's an adult tooth. Time for this lot to have a go, with fake teeth as a prop. Oh, my tooth! Now remember, we're showing you what to do in an emergency. Never do this on your own unless it is. And always try and find an adult. Here's a cloth to stop the bleeding. Use it to apply pressure right on the hole. Now you need to find that tooth and put it in a glass of milk. Fortunately, I have a glass of milk right here. Well done, Jennifer. So, if you've lost a tooth, stop the bleeding, 
put the tooth in a glass of milk and get yourself to the dentist. But always try to find an adult first. Now, do be careful up there, Chris. Don't worry, son. I've got it under control! <laughs> No further harm done to me. Ouch. Ouch. Zond, who ate my cake? Uh, I don't know what cake you're talking about. It was gone when I got here. A, a bird, I think, ate it. Or a man, a, ma a bird man. Bird man ate it. Zond, if you're going to tell Porkies, you're going to have to learn to hide the evidence a bit better than that. On second thoughts. Perhaps I can help you with this. More okay. cake. No, Zond. Time for investigation. Ouch. Come in, Dr. Zond. Come in, Dr. Zond. This is Dr. Chris. Over. Come in, Dr. Zond. Do you copy me? This is Dr. Chris. Over. Zond, it's Chris. Hey, I'm down here. Hello. Right, that's better. Now, I have a very special Operation Ouch mission for you. OK. You want me to be like James Bond or something? Exactly. You're going to be Operation Ouch 7. And like all top spies, you're going to have to go undercover and convince people that you're someone you're not. So basically you want me to lie? Yes, but these will be no ordinary lies, because you're going to be up against a new lie detector machine. I've sent Zond to the University of Bradford to see if he could hide the signs of lying from this snazzy new lie detector. OK, to be honest, it's not good to lie, but this is a scientific experiment. Zahn's up against master of lies, but he doesn't ever tell one, Professor Hassan Ugale. The lie detector uses cameras to examine a person's face when they're talking. Because your body has certain mannerisms when you lie, the lie detector can tell by the faces you're pulling if you're telling the truth or not. I wonder if my body language will give me away. But first, they're recording my facial expressions to see how my body behaves when I'm being honest. So Professor Hassan knows that everything I'm saying here is true. OK, Professor Hassan, I'm ready. What is your name? Alexander Van Tulliken. What is your twin brother's name? Christopher Van Tulliken. A few more honest answers, and that bit's over. The lie detector now knows what my face looks like when I'm being honest. Now I need to keep that same face even when I'm lying. From now on, Professor Hassan and his lie detector don't know whether I'm telling the truth or a lie. You'll know at home by these. Let's see if I can fool the lie detector with my fake, honest face. I can speak five languages. Hey, excuse me, mama, you. <laughs> OK. Uh, I worked in a pet shop selling dog collars. OK. I was recruited to be a spy while I was at university. Right. I did rowing, like I rowed in a boat. OK. Uh, I like to do ballet dancing. OK. Um, I've travelled to lots of countries. All right, thank you. Well, that wasn't too bad. I think I fooled him. We, we've got the results here. We actually believe that you lied quite a bit in the interrogation questions. Our results show that you actually lied about 50%. That's exactly right. The lie detector knows I lied on half of my answers. So what gave me away? We saw a little twitch on your forehead here. You had a high blink rate. OK. Yes. We had seen your no nostril dilate quite a bit. When I'm lying? When you were lying, yes. So a new facial expression means a lie? Yes. This sounds like it was quite easy for you to do. E yes, it wasn't too <laughs> difficult, really, to be honest. I, I don't thought think I was you... doing a really good job. I thought I really had you fooled. I don't think you're a very good liar. Actually, I take that as a compliment, Dr Hassan. Lying isn't a good idea, not least because your facial expressions, even your mannerisms, change every time you lie. You might not realise it, but things happen that you have no control over every time you tell a porky. Ouch. Let's head back to Accident and Emergency for another curious case. 
In Liverpool Accident and Emergency, 11-year-old Daisy is in with a sore tummy. I can't stand up properly because it makes me feel as if I'm going to faint and it makes me really dizzy. Right, let's find out how all this started. Daisy's tummy was feeling funny. <laughs> was it telling jokes, Chris? Did you hear the one about the... No, Zand, it was actually quite grumpy and sore. She wasn't able to go to school. She wasn't able to do her gymnastics. And at Mum's farm, Daisy couldn't ride her favourite horse. Hey, why not? Every time the horse jumped, Daisy's tummy gave her a thump. Ouch! This is Shakira. Ooh, nice coat. I want to get better so I can ride the horses again. Here to help get her back in the saddle is Dr Anne Kerr. It feels like someone's pushing down on my belly. There are lots of things that can cause your tummy to hurt, like a urinary infection or even appendicitis. I examined her tummy just to make sure it felt normal, that it wasn't too painful all over, and to try and find out where the pain was coming from. To help find out, the doc has ordered some blood tests to check up on Daisy's internal organs. Up, girl, hold on. While her samples are processed at the lab, Daisy's on her way to have another test. It's an ultrasound, which takes pictures of Daisy's internal organs and checks they're all OK. So you are all done? Meanwhile, at the Bloods Lab, Daisy's results have just come through. So what's the verdict? The good news is the ultrasound scan was absolutely normal and all the bloods are absolutely normal. Okay. Yay! But wait a minute, why does she have a sore tum? Sometimes kids get abdominal pain and can't find a cause for it um, and normally it just settles down on its own. But Daisy will need to get lots of rest to get back to normal. I'm going to lie on the couch for a little bit and then feed my guinea pigs. And my mum can feed the dogs. <laughs> OK, I'll feed the dogs. Well, that's that agreed, then. All's well that ends well. Bye, Bye Daisy. Daisy. So that's it till next time from Operation, Operation Ouch.